I'm Sam Chandon, the Silverstein Chair and Dean of the Shack Institute of Real Estate at the NYU School of Professional Studies. Um, and I, I want to begin uh, very briefly by thanking everyone uh, for joining us today, um, especially our discussants, uh, but also the roughly 1,200 people uh, that have uh, registered for today's webinar. Um, the last few months um, have offered a very blunt reminder uh, to all of us of the uh, reality of racial disparity um, in this country. Um, what's also really clear for all of us is that uh, that reality extends well beyond uh, the realm of policing. Um, we've seen extraordinary disparities um, in the mortality rate uh, from COVID-19, uh, with Black Americans dying at significantly higher rates than the broader population. Uh, we've seen uh, extraordinary disparities in the economic fallout uh, from the economy slide into recession, um, in job losses, in housing security, uh, in food security, uh, and certainly in real estate. Uh, disparities in representation at all levels of all of our organizations, um, in capital raising, in development, uh, in investment, uh, and in the commitment that each of our organi organizations shows uh, to different uh, communities of color around this country. Uh, I am very encouraged uh, that we have so many people here today who've joined us to participate um, in this conversation. Uh, but from conversations that I've had over the last few weeks with our students, with our friends in industry, what's also clear is that Shaq should have opened this dialogue and this conversation a long time ago and not waited until this very unique juncture uh, for our country. Uh, we have spent the last several years um, engaged in a dramatic expansion of our scholarship programs at SHAC, of our mentoring programs. Uh, just last week, uh, we announced um, a new endowment, diversity endowment in partnership with the Commercial Real Estate Finance Council, um, as well as uh, awarding our first graduate scholarship specifically for a student who attended a historically black college or university for their undergraduate degree that's accompanied by a scholarship program that is specifically geared towards a student who attended a historically Hispanic serving institution for their undergraduate degree as well. What we haven't done as we focused on expanding those programs and mentorship opportunities is to really take up and live up to our role as an academic institution in facilitating dialogue across the industry. I am uh, eager to get this dialogue going I recognize it as something that should have happened a long time ago. Um, I'm also eager to ensure that the dialogue is ongoing and that in a few months time, uh, we do not see attention simply turn to something else. Um, with that in mind, um, Jack is convening um, a cross industry working group on race in the real estate industry. Um, communities of color everywhere in this country deserve more than the outpouring of goodwill that we have seen over the last couple of months. We deserve an action plan for how we will address shortfalls in representation in our firms and institutions, as well as how it is that we will raise capital, develop new properties, and invest in communities. In just a few moments, I'm gonna pass this over to Craig Robinson, who will kick us off in introducing our panel but I'm also going to be sharing with you in the chat feature a link to information about that working group so that if you're interested in joining us or in simply hearing about the work of that working group, where we hope to bring together policymakers, elected officials, leaders in industry, faculty, researchers, students, that first mandate for that group will be to develop a set of very actionable recommendations for what it is that our industry needs to do next as well as providing advice and input and guidance to Shaq on how we can do our best to ensure that this conversation in the industry is one that is ongoing um, and not simply a response to the very real uh, challenges that we've seen over the last couple of months. But again, thank you all for joining us. Um, I really appreciate uh, the time and the commitment of everyone who's joining us as an attendee uh, and all of our panelists today. With that, I will pass it over to my friend and colleague, board member at the Shack Institute, Greg Robinson. You can hear me, but let me just thank you um, publicly for um, 
being a consistent uh, voice and leader and advocate for not only diversity and inclusion, but as you said, action. Um, I think we're all now kind of growing weary of the thoughts and prayers, heartfelt sentiments, and now really hungry for action. And I applaud your use of this platform and this institution to, to really, um, you know, move us in that direction. And, to, and I think today's discussion is really a, a very powerful first step in that direction. Uh, let me just also thank the folks who have joined us for this conversation. You, by being here, suggest that you're in solidarity with us or at Amen, looking to learn and understand and find your own way to act on issues of racial equity. But, but let me just start by framing this conversation. Um, it, this is about the Black experience in real estate. And we could have easily um, talked about diversity more broadly, talked about you know, issues of gender, um, and all of those are equally important topics. But today, we really wanted to be very focused on what is a, a, a very unique experience that Black people have had in this country and as a result in this industry. Uh, if we go back some time, our, our nation's founding principles of, of liberty and justice for all were written at a time when Black Americans were slaves. And well after Juneteenth, which we just celebrated a few days ago, Blacks continue to live under other forms of slavery, murderous persecution, and structural lack of access to education, housing, and economic opportunities. And so even today, um, you know, George Floyd and most recently Richard Brooks remind us that we're still just asking for our lives to matter, just to matter. And when we talk about diversity and inclusion, we're only asking to be included. So even this conversation does not even approach the things that we should be uh, demanding from society. And then when we talk a little bit about um, you know, where we are from a stats perspective, keep in mind that the US population is roughly 60% white and 13 to 14% black, yet less than 1% of all Fortune 500 CEOs are black, four to be exact. Um, yeah, I'll name them for you. There's Marvin at Lowe's, Kenneth at Merck, Roger at TIAA, Renee at MNT Bank, and G Day at Tapestry. And there's only been one black woman who is a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, and that was Ursula Burns, and she stepped down from Xerox in 2016. So there you have it. And then if we look into the commercial real estate, um, the stats are equally, if not more, dismal. According to NAOP in 2018, if we think about the executives that command this trillion dollar industry, white men are responsible for 78% of those roles, white women 14%. So combined 92% of all of the executive positions in commercial real estate are held by white men and women. Whereas black men are responsible for about 1.3% of those positions in black women, 1%. So 2.3% of all of the positions of influence are held by black people. And we all know, or at least many of us do, that this trend is unfortunately pervasive across all levels of the organization, from entry level to VP to C-suite to board seats, um, whether you're in the owner side, investor side, occupier side, service provider side, it doesn't matter. Uh, this is an industry-wide phenomenon. So the reason for this panel today is not only clear and compelling, but urgent. So today on this, for the next 60, 70 minutes, we're gonna do two, three things. Uh, number one, we're going to dig deep and understand what these issues are uh, and how they show up. Two, we're going to, through the voices and stories of our panelists, understand examples of how this really um, shows up in real life. Um, you, you, you see, Black people did not start dying at the hands of police at the invention with the invention of the smartphone. We, we were dying well before then, but it was just then that people started to take notice. So today we want people to take notice of what's happening in our industry. But third, we're going to conclude this discussion with some solutions, some ideas, and invite you all to be a part of that with some Q&A. So let me now turn to introducing my four amazing panelists who are not only colleagues and friends, but they're actually inspirations to me. I don't think I have had a chance to tell you guys that, but you're an inspiration to me. Um, so Margaret, Jim, Oney, and Tammy. Let me just start with Margaret. Uh, she is a partner at Goldman Sachs, where she leads the Urban Investment Group, UIG, which is a domestic multi-asset class, class investing and lending business that provides equity and debt to real estate projects, social enterprises, and small business lending facilities to benefit underserved communities. UIG has committed nearly $9 billion to date, serving as a catalyst in the revitalization of distressed urban neighborhoods, over 80% of which 
our minority communities. Margaret is also on the board of advisors of Launch with GS, Goldman Sachs' $500 million commitment to invest in companies with diverse leadership. And she had joined Goldman Sachs as an analyst in 2003, and was named managing director in 2013, and partner in 2018, a maven. Oney Payne is an equity owner and managing director Clarion Partners. She's a portfolio manager with responsibility for several billion in assets under management. Ms. Payne currently sits on Clarion's Career Management Committee and previously served on their investment committee from 2018 to 2020. She joined the firm in 2003 and began working in their real estate and, and finance industry in 1997. She has a magna cum laude graduate of Harvard College and she received her MBA from Harvard Business School. We actually overlapped. Um, in 2003, where she was a Robert Twigo Foundation Fellow. Tammy Jones has more than 20 years of experience in commercial real estate. Over her entire career, Ms. Jones has invested in and loaned CRE assets on behalf of some of the largest pension funds and institutional investors, including Equitable Real Estate, which is the largest pension fund advisor and investment management firm at the time, GMACCM, which was one of the largest CRE lenders owned by GM, and CW Capital, the US debt investment platform owned um, by one of the largest pension fund managers in Quebec. Ms. Jones is a seasoned veteran in CRE investments, capital markets, structured finance. Since 2009, she served as both co-founder and CEO of Basis Investment Group, which is a multi-strategy commercial real estate investment platform she founded with JEMB Realty Corporation that acquires and originates a variety of senior and support subordinated loans, preferred equity, and joint venture equity positions. She's currently, and uh, kudos to her, an independent director for Matt Cali Real Estate Corporation. She's a trustee of Georgia State University Foundation. She sits on their investment and real estate committee, and she's also the chair of the Real Estate Executive Council, Reese, which I belong to, and is also sits on the advisory board for NYU Shack Institute of Real Estate. Finally, last but not least, Jim. Uh, can we call you James or we call you Jim? I call you Jim. Jim is the CEO and managing partner of Ashland Capital Partners, where he serves as the head of the investment committee. He has over two decades of experience in real estate investment throughout the U.S. as well as in New York, including specifically in Upper Manhattan, where he is both a resident and a pillar of the community. At Ashland, he runs the day-to-day -day operations where he focuses on sourcing, structuring transactions through his deep relationships across the public and private sectors. Prior to joining uh, Aries Management in 2013 as a partner, Ms. Simmons was a partner at AREA, -E -E Property Partners, and Apollo Real Estate Advisors. Prior to joining Apollo, he led the Upper Manhattan Empowerment Zone as president and CEO, and has had tenure at both Solomon Smith Barney, Franker's Trust, GE. He has more degrees than I can name, but I'm going to try. He's a BS from Princeton University in Electrical Engineering. He has a master's from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State Universities in Systems Engineering and an MBA from Northwestern. Sheesh. Uh, Mr. Simmons is also a director on the following boards, Princeton University's National Alumni Giving Committee, Real Estate Executive Council, Princeton Alumni, Real Estate Network, and Kellogg's, Kellogg's Finance Network. So clearly just a mover and shaker. So uh, to my esteemed uh, panelists, thank you. Um, and I, I'm just going to set the stage that we all are here to hear your authentic voices. We hope you will um, be candid um, and, and lean into this opportunity for truth um, so that we all walk away with the benefits of your wisdom and the perspectives that you bring. Let's start with a little bit of stage setting. Um, you know, Sam opened up with some reflections on what's going on in society. We were having a national conversation on this topic of racial equity. And as you reflect on what's happening, I, I ask you two questions. Um, first and foremost, is this a movement or is this a moment? And if it is a movement, what's different? And, 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 and how does this movement potentially tie into the broader conversation that we're having today on commercial real estate? We'll start maybe with you, Margaret, and we'll work our way around. Um, moment versus movement. If so, what's different and how does it tie into commercial real estate? You know, I will say that I, I hope deeply it's a movement. Um, I think that there's a lot of 
cautious optimism. Certainly it's what, it's what I hope for. I think it's what my colleagues hope for, my, my family hopes for. I think that it is, I think that it's too early to tell. Um, I would say that as it relates to commercial real estate, I think there are two, I think there are two important nexus. I think that there are conversations happening like this in, in all industries, right? I think all of us are you know real estate professionals, but more broadly, we're finance professionals, which I think is another industry. And obviously, the the overlap and sort of nexus with real estate is strong. But you 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 look around, and it's a moment not just where you reflect in in horror on what's kind of reminded us and just like punched a hole in the world with what's happened with George Floyd and others, but when you when the rage subsides just a little bit and you're sort of in that phase of trying to be constructive you look around and you're like wow my my firm's not diverse my bosses aren't diverse my kids schools aren't diverse i, I think so it's it's everyone sort of you know almost going in these concentric circles of all the the ways in their own lives that that these issues show up so i think i think that it's it's an issue in real estate because real estate is yet just another part of corporate America in a way that is deeply not diverse. Um, I would say from for my specific seat, I think the reckoning happened like matters so, and I don't want to rank them, right? Because it, it all matters. But I feel like the, the place of real estate when you talk about lack of equity and representation and racial justice the lack of diversity is particularly nefarious because if you look at what we've been watching around the country, and certainly I felt this in, um, you know, we can all only speak for some of the more local protests around us, but certainly I, you know, I live sitting here in Brooklyn and these protests are obviously not just about George Floyd. They're about, they're about health disparities. They're about, housing inequities, they're about job loss, they're about the economic issues. And so when you start to trace all of those issues back, right, you can, you can take it back 400 years, you can take it back 200 years. And in our work, we, we take a lot of it back to the 1930s, right? When this government, um, through a couple agencies and through many policies, decided that it was perfectly okay and legal to allow the real estate industry, let's call it that, to not invest in black neighborhoods, right? That that was okay, that was legal, that was the plan. Um, and so if you think about how that gets corrected, adjusted, how you start to make up for that, how you start to reinvest in communities that have been underinvested for decades, of course representation matters, right? Real estate, it's not um, you know, it's not just an industry where we're all, you know, playing with spreadsheets and making deals and buying assets, but we are, we are framing and creating the built environment, right? Like people who allocate capital, who decide what sponsors to work with are literally deciding what neighborhoods get a grocery store and where workforce housing matters and what the rents are going to be and who the tenants are, like that is, um, it's so tangible and it's so literal and it impacts the way that communities operate every single day. And so to have so much of the challenges of Black America be very much rooted in place and where you grow up and what opportunities you not kind of um, theoretically have access to, but like physically and literally have access to in terms of education, healthcare, and access to public space, to have those decisions be made and controlled without the benefit of diverse thought and diverse ideas and very explicitly Black ideas and Black thought and Black sponsors, it's a, it's a, it's a losing equation. Um, and so my, my hope is that we're able to make this movement as you called it one where we really dig deep and not only decide that we need more blacks in corporate america we need more blacks in senior positions but why that why that really matters um 
So that's my hope. That's my hope. Sounds like you're cautiously optimistic. One movement moment. What do you think? Can you hear me okay? Yes. So similarly, cautiously, cautiously optimistic. I think what feels different to me this time um, is that I'm getting much more outreach from individuals, um, majority individuals. And when I say majority, I mean white people <laughs> uh, who, um, uh, who are my colleagues in the industry, uh, not just at my firm, but in the industry who, who at least for me or towards me are expressing for the first time, I am, and I've heard these words used, I'm ashamed that I was not more vocal about what is happening in America um, and what is happening in real estate. Mm -hmm. I would like to do better. Um, and I can't fix, I can't come up with all those answers for you. We can engage in a conversation. I can share my perspective. But for me personally, for the first time, more of those conversations are happening. Not one, many. Um, I am concerned, however, that there is a level of uh, performative allyship. Um, and this was, uh, I got this from a Forbes article over the weekend um, that I thought captured it really well. So there's this um, sense that people need to say something, which is a big plus from where we were several years ago, where it, it might have been mums the word, there would have been, you know, Amadou Diallo getting killed or Trayvon Martin getting killed, and not a word of it in the settings in which I navigate professionally the majority of my time, right? Um, so at least, uh, and I find great comfort in the fact that um, individuals, organizations are making statements, um, recognizing that work needs to be done. I think a lot of us were lulled into complacency when President Obama was elected, like, okay, we got a black man as president, now anything is possible. And that was one major step, but there's still, um, and honestly, we're reeling from a lot of the backlash um, in my perspective of having an African-American president. Um, and I, I, I hope, um, and I'm doing my part of, I'm trying to do my part of the, the discussion of, of the work in terms of trans, uh, translating statements into tangible actions um, that last not just when we have um, removed ourselves from the distraction of um, uh, uh, when the lack of distraction that has been the case from you know working from home uh, as a result of COVID not having all these other things to to um, to take your consciousness away from the reality that exists today I am hopeful that, um, and this is to the point that Sam made in his opening remarks, that this is a lasting change. Um, I'm hopeful. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that. Tammy. So One and Margaret uh, stole a lot of my thunder. No, that's, um, we, we are living some of the same experiences. Um, so I don't want to be repetitive. I'll try to add some things. Um, in addition to real estate um, creating place, as Margaret said, we also have an opportunity to create wealth. And I wanna talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, if you think about the net worth of a Caucasian family, depending on which study you use, it's about $171,000. Compare that to 17,000 for an African-American family. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Well, Margaret, Margaret alluded to part of that. Part of that had to do with redlining, but there was something else. It was the GI Bill, which lifted and created a middle class in white America. And think about the generational wealth that was created, being able to um, start businesses, being able to pay for college, all of these things, our communities as African Americans, we were not able to do. And that has impact. I read a study that said that if we do nothing, and I'm saying to everyone on this call, if we do nothing and we make this a moment and not a movement, then it, it will take us 250 years to catch up. So that's not an option. So like Margaret and One, I am cautiously optimistic, but I actually see opportunity. In adversity, I see opportunity. And there's a great opportunity 
for real estate, the real estate community to really step in because that difference in net worth, the main driver on the balance sheets is real estate. And so it's, it's, I, I get excited by that. And I've been talking about this and I know I can probably speak for my fellow panelists in that these aren't new issues for us. I mean, the tri for me personally, I was so overwhelmed with this trifecta of COVID, unprecedented, we kept using that word, with you know, that affecting the economy, which affected our communities, both from the healthcare disparities as well as unemployment. That was sort of the one-two punch. You know, and then we have our human rights brutally violated. And I'll tell you one thing for me, there was a shift. There was a shift in me finally not having to tell the story as to why can't you just um, pull yourself by your, up by your bootstraps? And why can't everybody else do that? You know, you've done it. And, and I, I really feel like now we know that at every turn there, that structural racism is alive and well. And I do believe that there, this time, um, of all times, we can't do it alone. We need white Americans, we need Latino Americans, we need Asians, we need all of us, African American community as well, to come together because this needs to have um, sy systemic change. It has to meet what I call, what I refer to as structural racism. And, and Tammy, you're spot on. That trifecta for us has been around for the past few decades, health disparities, high unemployment levels, and then, you know, an attack on our human and, and civil rights. So, um, amen. Um, Jim, maybe you're more optimistic. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think so, Craig. Um, first of all, I am happy to be last and least of this August panel. So, um, to my fellow panelists, I am I continue to be energized by each of you. Um, so I dearly hope that this is a movement and I hope that this is our stonewall. I hope this is our me too. I hope that we change the trajectory of not only our race in real estate, but our race in, in general. Um, I think that what happened in this particular instance, which jarred America, um, was front and center the pure brutality of what occurred and the fact that this has been happening over time, um, really I've been swept under the rug. Um, I can go back to Yusef Hawkins, you know, back when when we were young and time and time again this occurred. But this time it was different in that, um, you know, I've said this, if it were Lassie and he were kneeling on the neck of Lassie, how would people have viewed that? And how would have America gone to, to great lengths and, and great pains of how um, this individual treated uh, the family's best friend? And that if you could not have empathy for him at that moment, those eight plus minutes um, to see the life seep, seep out of his body, then um, we have missed the definition of humanity, right? That is the pure definition of, of what separates us from um, our uh, animal brethren. So I think that, that that has jarred the conscience of America in a way that um, things have in a long time, have not in a long time. So <clears throat> that has got people to look inward and to think, what have I done what have I not done in my life? Am I a part of this problem? And if I'm a part of the problem, um, how can I be part of the solution? Now, that's, that takes um, a lot of, of time and self-reflection to take words and put them into action. And I'm hopeful that the words that we're hearing and the statements that have been put out by almost every firm um, 
actually equate to real change, we'll talk about later. Um, but I've had some of these discussions before. Um, we've all been a part of task force. We've all been a part of, of meetings. We've all had DNI discussions about issues that are systemic to either a firm or to an industry. Um, and change has yet to be forthcoming. So I am optimistic that the 20s and 30s and perhaps my children won't stand for this. And that'll be the difference this time. And that, you know, the reason why they're in the streets is because they recognize that um, there's been very few times in the history of the world where power accedes to anything other than power. And so, and so un until the, um, the two meet, which is the, the kids who are in the street and the people who are in the boardrooms and the people in the boardrooms make the decision that for the health of our union, that we have to change in some meaningful way because this is not sustainable then I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat optimistic that that message has gotten through. But like I said, I've had these conversations before. Yeah. Jim, you, Tammy, and One talked a lot about your interactions with allies. I'll just use that term. And, and, and you trying to have them imagine, you know, what, you know, and be empathic to, to what we're experiencing. And when I think about Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail, it wasn't a black clergy, it was the non-black clergy, right? Um, many of the folks on this call are allies or potential allies who may understand, um, you know, someone dying at the hands of a police officer, but may not understand the day to day types of racism that you've experienced in your careers. And to Tammy's point might be saying, well, gee, why don't you just pull yourself up from your bootstrap? If, if you could just all take a minute to describe some very concrete examples of the ways in which you've seen racism show up in our industry, in your careers, getting in, staying in, rising up, accessing capital, accessing opportunities, so that people have a real tangible understanding of what it looks like in our industry. And I'll circle back to you, Margaret, since you were the first. Too many examples. Within, um, I know, I know we don't have to. <laughs> yeah, I maybe, maybe I'll put it into, 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 themes and some of some of this is some of this is my own personal experience and some of it is you know my kind of you know colleagues and and friends in the industry you know i think un until you get to be an one or or a tammy or or a jim and then actually far, probably even still at even those kind of tremendous levels of success there is a sense that and i've felt this quite directly, that I just shouldn't be where I am, that there was some mistake, um, that you know, something got lost in translation. I still walk into meetings where people are waiting for the person who runs the business or the person who, you know, makes the decisions or the person who writes the checks. And it starts, sometimes there's the blatant, like literal, like you're Margaret. Like, yes, like that's, I am Margaret. I get there are not many black Margarets, but yes, here I am. Um, and then, and then what I find even worse is sort of sometimes the more, more subtle sort of, so, so who, who are you going to go talk to after this meeting? Like who, who then will really decide? And I literally have to say things and it's infuriating. Like, no, I chair the investment committee. I chair it. I'm not just on it, I chair it. And sometimes that's, it, 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 it almost depends on sort of the day and the moment. Sometimes that is, can really throw you off, right? Like you're, you're performing, you're doing diligence, you're building a relationship, you're growing the business, you're putting out capital, you're taking on risks, right? Those are, that's where your mind share should be. Um, and sort of coming into pretty often direct contact with the notion that 
even after taking the steps that you have taken and the politicking and the time and the effort to achieve whatever success you've gotten to, that it is literally incredible for people that they just don't believe it and are so bold about that, that they are willing to question it to my face. And then there are the points where I want to say, well, you don't need to worry about that investment committee anymore because you're not getting our capital, right? And that's at least like the, the small bit of power you get to take back. But I, I think that it is, I think that it is deeply um, difficult to just, to just not have your position, not even respected, but like literally believed. Um, so that's just, just one example. Margaret, I think we're all snapping our fingers. Like, yeah, you know, in fingers. Yeah, we, we totally get it. Anybody else want to jump in on that one? I, I have to, because yeah, if, if my sister Margaret is getting that at Goldman in her position, then imagine Tammy as an entrepreneur out there trying to raise capital because access to capital is so much harder for us. And I have had to knock, knock on so many doors and have felt that, that level of humiliation when you know your track record is good, when you know that you have an amazing team, when you've worked hard, and I prior, as, as uh, uh, Craig said, I was in you know, very large institutions before I made the thoughtful decision to go out on my own. It's almost like you know, your, your pedigree is always questioned. And I have actually felt this way for my entire career. I always felt like I had to be better, stronger, faster, have better degrees, you know, make sure that there was no stone unturned because mm -hmm. the only thing that I could do was outwork people, right? I didn't have the relationships. Um, you know, real estate is a legacy business. Let's just call it what it is. There is a closed network. And many folks like us don't have families that understand real estate. And I'll just tell you my own personal experience. I grew up, grew up in a two bedroom apartment in Southeast Queens with eight people. I had no idea what the real estate industry was. And so for, for me, it has been just trying to figure it out, baptism by fire, and, and I, yes, I have had, I think none of us on, on this uh, uh, webinar panel can say that we created our careers alone. There were angels along the way. There were people along the way that helped, but there weren't enough, okay? And there were no people that looked like me in, in any of the senior roles or very few. I never saw any black women um, on boards. And, and you know what? Sometimes it, it just, it takes away your, your drive when you can't see a pathway and what I'm hoping will change now is that we are here having this discussion because we, we want all of you who are you know, in the pipeline and hopefully you know, some are, are really excited about this industry to see a pathway. And what upsets me most is that when I look in front of me and when I look behind me, I don't see a robust pipeline. And that's why it's so dire. Mm -hmm. here, you know, and, and just, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, I have loaned and invested almost 800 million with other minority and women-owned businesses because I know how hard it is to raise capital. And, and I believe that you can be intentional and we're gonna talk about some solutions, but I believe that there is a way to get capital to women and minorities and, and, and African-Americans is gonna focus on that. But I, I just don't think that our industry has um, really put those strategies in place or even thought about it as a real disparity because corporate inequity is one of the biggest offenders. And we can talk about all the other things because they're all there, but we have to really deal with that within corporate America and, and more specifically in real estate. Yeah, I'll jump in just with a couple examples. One, um, uh, I'll talk a little bit about microaggressions, which Margaret um, uh, spoke to, but I'll start with one macroaggression. Most of the time, it's not that blatant. But I do recall just a couple of years ago, um, having a big business, big piece of business to allocate. So I interviewed a bunch of brokers, um, allocated it to one brokerage team. Um, it got back to me through an ally that one of the teams that um, was not awarded the business was pissed um, because um, as a member of the Black Mafia, I needed to to, to, to uh, to award the business to someone else who had a diverse team. Um, and so this particular group had, you know, one 
um, one black person on it with whom I am um, a friend, but really it wasn't that the team was the highest functioning. It was because um, we were a member of the black mafia in real estate. Um, okay. Uh, I'll say my friend. Can, I, jo the can other. I join the black mafia? We're recruiting. <laughs> um, and, and I will say uh, the other side of it was my friend who uh, was the male at the brokerage firm who chose to look at it as, you know what, there at least there are enough numbers that we could potentially constitute a mafia. So there's some silver lining, right? Um, the majority of the time, though, what we face are microaggressions where you're not sure, you know, like, like Margaret said, how you're, why you're being spoken to a certain way, why for the past hour I've been on this property tour, I'm the decision maker, but the person leading the tour who works at the company has not looked at, looked me in the eye once. Um, maybe it's because I'm short. Um, I don't know, but I spend so much time, um, unfortunately, and energy working through, okay, probably not that, hopefully it's not that, but it, 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 it occupies a lot of my energy, my consciousness. Um, and I was, and it, I think it speaks to what a number of other um, folks, people of color, black people feel and it is undermining the potential of organizations, right? So um, studies have shown that if the highest performing teams are those which um, create psychological safety for their employees, right? Where you can take risks, moderate risks, um, uh, and no one likes to fail, but there's a way to um, turn that into something greater, um, uh, into a learning experience where you can, um, where there's a higher level of creativity um, because the people in the room feel like their voices are going to be heard, right? I do feel like my voice is usually heard today within my institution and I made a great choice in, in joining Clarion, um, you know, 17 years ago out of business school, um, but there's still this feeling um, of um, not enoughness um, in yeah. certain instances um, of, you know, feeling of lack that I know is an impediment to um, my contributions to perhaps my firm, but certainly to a broader industry because there's this, this, this barrier that exists. And I, and I, I talked to one of my other majority colleagues last week, one who um, decided he wanted to do better. And he said, you know, the reality is, most of us can't bring our full selves to work. You know, I get that. Um, the suit that you wear every day, maybe it's not 100% comfortable for you, but yours is made out of cotton and mine is made out of armor because I'm not always comfortable in these environments. Um, and so I would just point to, yeah, there's that the overt stuff, but there's all this micro stuff, unconscious bias um, that, um, ultimately suppresses um, creativity and innovation. Um, and um, I don't have an automatic solution for it. No one does, but um, that's part of the reality for me. And, and it's exhausting. I'm sorry, I was just going to say, I was so inspired by you, One, because like it, it's, and it actually is helpful to, to me to hear these stories, you know, as someone I don't know, Oney, that we've ever had this direct conversation. We talked around yeah. some of this stuff. Um, but what came up for me while you were speaking was culture. Like, I don't know that I've always felt welcome in the culture. And I feel like the culture has to shift to welcome everyone. And I feel like like you're talking about armor. I, you know, well, I felt the same way. It's, it's about the culture, though. The, the, the networks that don't necessarily invite you in, the you know the events that you're not invited to, the things that we may not do as African Americans. I'm not a golfer. I didn't really know how to play tennis. Yes, I learned how to golf. I learned how to do all these things trying to assimilate in early in my career. And as I was able to go up the ranks, I you know I've just decided to be my authentic self. And I know that's hard to to you know to say and to admit, but I'm going to be in my vulnerable space here and. I tried really hard to figure out ways to be in the, you know, the good old boys club to try to figure out how I could endear myself. 
And then I realized it just couldn't, it wasn't really working. So it was more about mm -hmm. being, you know, the best real estate investor and practitioner you could be. Does that, does that make sense? Makes sense. And Jim, I, I would love to just pick, piggyback on Tammy's point because you've been partnered at a number of big firms and some people would be surprised to know that even actually the further you move up your career, actually the more difficult racism can be because there's only one CEO, there's only a few partnerships, there's only a, a limited equity pool. And so now you're, you're actually really taking something from someone else if, if, if you get it, right? And so maybe talk a little bit about how that racism perhaps intensifies in some ways the further you move up. Well, I, I think that... Um... I'll speak for myself, and I think that I could probably speak for the others on the panel, including you. I think that where we are in the station in our careers is a de facto example of why that is the case. As much as we've all accomplished, okay, and I know for a fact how good Tammy is, I know how good you are, I know how good One and, and Margaret is we all have been limited in our career trajectory in some way, shape or form. I mean, we have, um, there was not a single firm that I worked at where I believed that there was the possibility of me acceding to the CEO seat. Not one. And that reality, as you go in on a daily basis, tells you that if, if you want to get to your ultimate goal, which the ultimate goal in a capitalist society is to accumulate wealth, then you have to find other paths. And so from my first job at General Electric to my last, um, while, and again, I, I don't have any, any animus towards any of the organizations or any of the individuals there, but the facts are what the facts are. Um, if I looked at a prototypical person who happened to not be of my persuasion, but had a similar or dare I say inferior um, pedigree and background. And if you look at their careers and, and where they've ended up and the wealth that they've amassed, it's, it's not even close. So if I look at um, Tammy, who should have five to 10 billion in AUM, right? Um, why do we not have a 10, 15, $20 billion firm in real estate that is owned by a person or a black person? Uh, it's certainly not talent. It's certainly not training. It's certainly not, um, persistence, um, all, the, all of the skills that have gotten us to where we are today are relevant to success. But somewhere along the way, that path was either stunted or, or blocked or shifted such that you had to maneuver and you, you had to take a different path. So when I, when I first got on, on the street, um, I got introduced to some traders and I decided that was what I wanted to do. And so I asked, how does one become a trader? And the answer was, well, you have to get an MBA. And I said, but I see a couple of people who, um, I think there might've even been a person who hadn't even gone to college, but the, but the rules were different. So if you take the two years that I went to school Right. If, if you take the trajectory that I might have had, where I would have stepped up to run a desk, um, who knows where I might have ended up. But I had to find another route. I went to get an MBA. So, you know, as much as much as I love learning, um, I did not have the luxury of going to school just for the sake of going to school. If there was there was an end, uh, there was a mean to there was an end to an end purpose to doing so and um that was getting to where i am today via a securitist route and so the systemic uh racism as we want to define it which is that 
African Americans are not accepted into the careers that are most lucrative or the paths that are most lucrative. Um, and we can name them, you can say investment banking, PE, um, VC, private equity, um, hedge funds, you know, those areas where um, the paths that one might have found in corporate America where some people blaze the trails in the 70s and 80s, they just don't exist. And so the reason why you have groups like Twigo and like SEO and like Inroads is because we were barred from getting in the door. And now that we are in the door, um, the ascendance to um, a position where you are actually running the entire operation, I, I don't know if I'll see it in, in, my, in my lifetime, I hope so. Um, but part of the tragedy here is if we can't do that, given everything that we accomplished and, and all of, of our expertise, what does that portend for the generations after us and what do they have to look forward to? Uh, great, very powerful reflections, Jim. I, I want to maybe take a different approach with this, this next question and, and Margaret, go to you. Um, it, it was once said that, that you can't appeal to the immoral people on the basis of morality. So, so a lot of what we've been saying is that this is just wrong. This is immoral. Um, but you've built a business um, actually that proves that this is just the right thing to do. It's, it's good for business. It's good for the economy. T just talk a little bit about um, why else we should be, you know, thinking about a more diverse and inclusive industry and, and how that shows up in, 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 in the rest of, of the economy. Yeah, I will give a, a short answer and then I'll give a longer answer. My short answer is that black sponsors have made us tons of money. I mean, there's, there's no like, tons, lots. Okay, drop the mic. I like dollars to throw. Um, so so that's, that's, that's one compelling reason and I think it should be enough. Um, unfortunately, we know it's not enough. Um, but, but I would say, and, and you know, Tammy kind of kicked off with us being a little bit more vulnerable here, right? The, the, the team that I run at Goldman, we are, we're not doing enough, um, right? None of us are, are doing enough. Well, I actually had some really kind of, um, I think we, we all had our sort of ups and downs over the last few weeks, but I, w I went into a pretty, um, like sort of dark place with this moment of, you know, so many of the places that are, you know, disproportionately impacted by COVID, where are we seeing these health disparities, where we're seeing some of the most kind of significant riots, like these are, these are places where we invest, like where we're focused, like these are the communities we are focused on. And by definition, we haven't done enough, right? And so there's, it, it would obviously be completely arrogant for for me to think that like, you know, one investing team and, and one effort would have would have changed these places, but it did, it did make me think and really my whole team about we're not doing enough. Right. So one of the things we're proud of, we we disproportionately invest with black sponsors, like multiples of our percentage in the population, certainly multiples and multiples and multiples of sort of the, the representation that exists within real estate. And that's, that's really good. And I'm really proud of it. And again, it's made us lots of money. Um, but I think, I think we haven't done enough and I personally haven't done enough around the diversity in all of the organizations that we work with, right? This can't just be about more capital for black sponsors, black developers, you know, black fund managers. That's a huge piece of it that has to that has to be at the forefront, but like to, you know, to Jim's point, and I think Tammy mentioned this too, about the pipeline, there won't be the next Tammy to run her own fund until the organizations and institutions that build up that expertise and provide the track record and the platform that you are working off of 
as more diversity. And so I think that the case is first and foremost commercial, right? We've all seen the studies about how diverse teams outperform and how we're just missing amazing talent. But I also think it's, it's a cycle. Like we need to encourage and invest in the more diverse institutions so that they are then amplifying and creating more of the pipeline so that there are more black sponsors and entrepreneurs to also be investing capital with. So I think it's, you know, one of the things that I've been frustrated by in kind of the, you know, the corporate response across the board in, in, in this country is sort of like, you know, what's going to be our one thing, right? Like, what are, what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. And it's not about what you're going to do. It's about how you radically transform everything that you do, right? It's like this, and I know this was not your question and now I'm on a tangent, but like to, to, this, to, this, to this point about sort of allyship and whether it's real estate, corporate America, finance, et cetera, it's not about the extra thing you're gonna go do, right? Protesting is great. I think everyone should do it. I protested a lot. I think the financial, the, you know, the philanthropic contributions are good. I think the reach outs are good, but I, it, it's almost simpler to just decide what am I going to do in my day to day? Like, who am I going to hire? What broker? Who am I going to invest capital with? Where am I going to invest? Like, those are the decisions you're making every day. So change those. It's almost like take a, take a lazier approach. What were you already doing? And just do that differently. You don't have to go off and like start the next not for profit. Like you use your power and privilege in the way that is natural. Um, and I read this thing that I have to say because it was, it was so powerful is that, you know, it's very in vogue to acknowledge your privilege these days. Like we're all privileged because, you know, where we went to school or where we live or the job that we have. But like that recognition and acknowledgement of privilege is irrelevant if you're not willing to A, give some of it up or to use it. And so I would say from like where back to your actual question about like what, what we're doing and what we're going to do, look, we invest a lot in black communities. It's what we do. We invest a lot with black sponsors and we're going to do more of that and do it more intentionally and with more focus than ever before. Not in this moment, but you know, till they drag me out of the place. I, I want to come to Tammy and One on this next one, and then we're going to pivot to solutions and then open it up for some Q&A. Um, I, I said at the beginning of this call that we're going to just talk about the Black experience, but it would be wrong not to acknowledge intersectionality um, of being not only Black, but being a woman. And in some cases, even being, you know, a, from a family that was not originally American, um, Caribbean or Nigerian. Just talk a little bit about maybe the, the additional burden that I would imagine you face that Jim and I can't appreciate of, of that intersectionality in your your careers. Um, One, you want to start? Sure. Um, one thing I will do before I start on intersectionality, though, would be encourage our panelists to take another look at the business imperative. There was a great podcast um, on NPR that spoke about um, the work of Dr. Lisa Cook, who is at um, uh, Michigan State. And she looked at innovation theory, uh, which basically says, you know, in addition to investing in um, capital, labor, um, if you um, invest in innovation, specifically um, patents, um, uh, Paul Romer was the Nobel laureate um, that won um, in the I think 90s for um, his work on showing the, the uh, correlation between patents as proxy for innovation. Um, and economic growth, right? So she said there's one, um, one hole in the theory. That theory assumes that laws are enforced equally. Um, if you have a system of laws um, that results in inequitable distribution, you are going to miss out on the innovation that is associated with people of color. Her, her research, um, looked um, through, you know, past hundred years and showed, you know, when the black race riots in Tulsa, Oklahoma um, happened in 1921, the level of uh, patents dropped significantly from black uh, African-American inventors mm -hmm. dropped significantly. And to this day, 1899 is the, high, the year in which the highest, on a per capita basis, there was the highest level of invention uh, for, uh, uh, highest level of pat patents for um, African-Americans. So what are we missing out on? 
there's a significant mm -hmm. business imperative for you investing in diversity and inclusion. There are metrics that you can find to, to, um, to support that, but I'd encourage you to look at this um, podcast on NPR, Dr. Lisa Cook and her work on innovation theory. Mm -hmm. Intersectionality, moving on. <laughs> Um, I'm a black woman who was not born in this, um, in the United States. I was born in the Caribbean and Jamaica. So I'm a proud Jamaican, Jamaican American. Um, and I think the way that I show up um, is really different, um, can be different um, than what um, some of my colleagues are used to you know, dealing with. You, um, you already noted the statistics in terms of you know, what the Fortune 500 looks like at the executive level. And there's really, and at the bottom was black women, right? So I think there are a lot of corporations that are doing, corporations and groups that are doing some great work in trying to address diversity, but they're lumping it into um, one umbrella, right? So if we address the needs of all women, um, you know, we'll address the needs of black women and we'll, or all people will address the needs of black men. These are completely different approaches that need to be taken, that need to be contextualized, that need to be individually strategized for the populations um, that you're trying to address um, and your own specific organization. Obviously, it starts with a baseline of data, um, and too many organizations don't even have that baseline of data, or they're not willing to share it. They may know it, but they're not willing to share it broad broadly because um, there's some fear that um, they will be perceived badly and, you know, uh, rightly or wrongly that exists. Um, but um, there needs to be a higher level of accountability by tracking your, um, the data within your organization, parsing that data um, by level. Uh, so the fact that you have a lot of black people in the accounting pool, it's, it still means you're, could still mean yourself a significant issue at the partner level for black people, for black women, uh, for black men. So um, just for me personally, um, the groups that try to, and I'm grateful they exist. Um, I have said this to friends one day and several times that, you know, some days I'm not sure whether I need to be more black, whether I need to be more of a woman, whether I need to be a black woman, because there, there really are um, different struggles that need to be fought, and there are different ways um, of fighting each of those struggles. So I'll just share that. That that was very well put. I I couldn't agree more. I feel like it's almost like the the one two punch. Um, women in real estate have you know our own issues, and sometimes I've struggled to find you know my place in that because you know I've watched some of the progress, and I'm happy for, you know, my white sisters to have made a lot of progress, particularly in the court arena, where the last decade has been, you know, really um, uh, the, the year of, of the white woman to get on boards. And I think this year, I read this, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not mad at it, I'm just pointing out the facts, that in 2019, in the REIT space, this is like an interesting and, and a fact that actually surprised me, of, you know, the hundreds of, of REIT um, director uh, positions, 52% went to women and the majority of them were white women. And just conversely, um, since 2008, um, black men and women, the statistics have may, may moved like a half a percent or something like that. And so that's a real fact. And that's something that I think speaks to being in that confused place where, you know, I, I definitely feel um, uh, inspired by women's issues, but sometimes I feel alone when it comes to the, the disparity that even African American women have when compared to the pay of Caucasian women and the healthcare disparities. And sometimes when I would attend women's events um, that are led by, I'll say, majority women, I, I sometimes feel very alone because I could be one of a few Black women in the room. And so I do think that this conversation and this moment is also about us trying to find con connectivity and connection with not just you know white men, but all in real estate, but also white women. Because I do think that, like One said, the issues there are some similarities, but there are some differences. And so um, I'm hopeful that with the same sort of intentional strategy, where you had the state of California saying that we want to have at least two women on boards, where you have um, the proxy firms 
uh, looking at um, ESG, you know, and the S and saying, we really want to make sure we have women on boards, gender diversity, gender diversity. But sadly, it was, you know, at the expense of African American men and women. And, and that's hard. So, so, but it's, but it, it is encouraging. And I think it proves the theory that with intentionality, you can make um, systemic change and it can be real change and it can happen, you know, pretty quickly. And I also agree with One. There's a study that McKenzie does every year. They just updated that, that, that supports the fact that diverse teams outperform non-diverse teams. And what, you know, final point that I'll make is even with that data, and that data has existed, you know, the Knight Foundation has done studies, you know, there is just so much data out there that shows that if you want to find alpha, you really should have diversity on your teams, but it's just been ignored. And, and I find it particularly, um, I guess the word distressing is coming to, coming to my mind for an industry that prides itself on demographics and why demographics, you know, are so important in investment decisions where we look at markets and who's there and consumer behavior. And we just have completely ignored that America is go going to be a majority minority country. And the fact that the demos are pushing for us to welcome, you know, um, and I think it's super important important in an industry like this to take advantage of that and to realize that um, not only is there a moral imperative, but it, it will yield, uh, lead to better returns. And I just, I just hope, I'm hopeful that, you know, that we'll get there. This, this next round of questions um, is about solutions, but I just want to end on one note on yours, Tammy, about boards. It's, it's interesting. Um, there are only 322 black directors at 307 companies. So do the math, there's a lot of recycling of the same people, um, you know, kind of musical chairs from board to board. Um, and two, out of 187, which is 37% of the S&P 500, not one single um, one of those companies had a black director, period. 37% of the S&P 500 did not have one single black director. So this is, this is dismal. But Jim, I, 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 I'm going to start with you because I'm I'm hopeful that you've got some solutions for us. And I want to talk, talk about solutions both from the individual perspective. There are people on this call who are saying, what can I do to navigate racism in my career? Perhaps I'm an ally. What can I do to be a better ally? Maybe I'm a company leader and I have influence. What should I do? Um, so think about solutions kind of holistically. And then we're going to just do a round robin. And then Sam, go to you for Q&A. So Jim, let's start with you. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a couple of points. Um, the first that I want to make is that <clears throat> um, my success to date certainly was due to the sponsorship of people who didn't look like us. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, from my very first job to my very last, there were people who were stewards of my career and who helped me along the way. Having said that, they should have done that, right? That they're, they should have done it because I was someone who was a high potential employee who ultimately it paid off very handsomely because I made the firms um, a lot of money along the way. So just like they should mentor um, any person who comes in who they see has potential they should have done that for me which they did so um while thankful and grateful it is something that should have happened um so to those who who ask what they can do they should do that they should look across their organizations and uh look at the individuals who have promise and put them on a path to success and to, to shield them, to teach them, to give them the opportunities to grow and to, to expand. Um, for those who, who are in positions to seat boards, um, you should make a commitment to have someone of color on your board and specifically a, a black person. Um, you should, it is not only good business, but there is not a, an industry um, in America, but certainly not within real estate that does not touch, depend upon, um, or in some way, shape or form, um, owe 
uh, its profitability to people of color and black people specifically. Whether you're in hospitality, whether you're in industrial, um, if you are taking pension, public pension money, which is overwhelmingly the money of retirees who are people of color, you should be obligated to have someone in the room who is representative of those individuals whose money you're investing. Um, you should be looking within your organization and understand what your retention rates are. Mm -hmm. And not only understand them, but publish them so the world can see. Um, you should look at your senior leadership. And when you look at your management committees, when you look at your operating committees, when you look at those groups of people, the small groups of people who make the decisions which drive the trajectory of the firm, who is in the room and why are they in the room? Are they in the room because they were your buddy or they got to the firm because they were um, your friend's son and they moved up the ranks? Or is it that the person worked really hard and, and deserved to be there? Um, I think that your if if you're large enough to have a, a DNI function and a person, empower them. Empower them to to actually effectuate change. Um, such that it is not a position that is one for PR or where you have someone show up at conferences, but where you, you actually empower them to to make changes up and down the organization. Um, um, and lastly, I would say, look at the way that you, you spend your, your corporate dollars, right? Who does your firm hire? You, you hire lawyers, you hire accountants, you hire um, title agents, you hire appraisals, appraisers, um, you hire insurance brokers. Who are providing those services? How did they get in the door? Um, you should be diversifying those sets of companies and making an active effort to seek out firms um, that are led by black people. And to the extent that you don't, um, when they walk in the door, you should be asking the very same questions. What does your leadership team look like? And, and who is making the decisions um, within your firm? Uh, I was a part of, of a, a discussion about diversity at, at one of the firms I worked and they threw out a, a number of, of how diverse the firm was. And I said, well, I don't know which accounting is diversity. I'm sure it is all inclusive, but I was the single senior person of color within the firm. So um, diversity where diversity matters, which is who can hire, who can fire, who, can, who has budgetary control, who, who has control of the investment decision. Those are, those are the positions where you can really effectuate change and you can, you can bring in um, principles, people, and effectuate change where um, others perhaps cannot. Do you mind if I go after Jim? Because I also want to share something that we didn't say, um, if that's okay. So, so Jim and I are actually partners. Um, we, uh, I'm the chair and Jim is the vice chair of an organization called Real Estate Executive Council. And everything that Jim said, you know, Reese has been really working on um, to put together what we've been calling the diversity ecosystem, which means that you can't, you have to have a multifaceted approach, which is what Jim just described. You can't just do one thing, you have to do a number of things. And so what we're advocating is to have from early stage pipeline, so we have a high school program that at the end of this summer, Jim, will be about 400 kids that we have put through a summer two week immersion program in real estate. Craig has participated in the program um, and spoke to the kids. And, and I'm really excited about that because that's early stage pipeline. Google's doing it, Microsoft is doing it, and we're doing it. And these are diverse you know, African-American and Latino kids that are talented, that deserve a chance. And so, but you also have to look in, in the middle and you have to make sure that as, as Jim said, you know, before you go out there looking for additional pipeline, Find out with your own team that's, you know, of African-Americans in your company. Do they have sponsors? Do they have mentors? So middle management. And then all the way through, we talked about the leadership team. We talked about boards. Like, literally, you have to check that. And so what Jim just described is something that I'm just astonished that we don't have 
most companies don't have a diversity business plan. Now let's imagine if we were gonna launch a multifamily strategy, right? You, you would likely have concrete strategies, that's A. B, you would have some performance metrics. You would say, okay, I'm gonna invest in value add in the middle market. My performance metric would be my IRRs and you know, my returns. And then you would have an accountable team whose compensation was tied to the success of that business or that venture. So let's do the same thing for diversity, guys. Let's just call it what it is. We're leaders, we're CEOs, we lead trade organizations, or people you know, who hopefully will take this lesson and, and do this one day. Design a diversity business plan where you have you know, concrete strategies. So we just heard a few of them. Jim listed all of them. If you do me a favor, go take Google your own board and leadership. And if you don't see any black folks there, that's a strategy, right? If you don't have sponsorship for, for the existing African Americans in your company, that's a strategy. Then, then what is your baseline? You know, Reese is big on saying, start somewhere. And if you, if something isn't measured, it's not going to change. It just won't. Um, and then finally, Make sure that you have a team accountable. It's not just one person. It has to start at the top. And what it really frustrates me is, yes, we do a lot of recruiting at the college level, and that's important. And believe me, I'm doing the same thing. But change starts at the top. I think, you know, Margaret said this earlier, change starts at the top. And if you don't have the leadership change, then the kids that come in or the pipeline that comes in, you can't be it if you can't see it. And, and people will leave. And we have absolutely had that problem. So design a diversity business plan, run this like you would run any business and you will see success. Sam, I know you're trying to get to some questions. So One, Margaret, do you guys have anything you want to add to that? Two very quick things, practical examples for our uh, opportunities to build your pipeline. Um, I think there's been a lot that's been addressed already. I'm an alumna of the Robert Twigo Foundation, T-O-I-G-O, -O, focused on um, uh, getting underrepresented minorities into financial services. Um, so one great uh, tool um, to build your pipeline at the MBA level, Robert Spiegel uh, organization. Um, SEO, uh, Jim mentioned earlier in the call, there's a, uh, Priya has, a, has raised a lot of funds for SEO. So really focused on college le level talent, uh, diverse college level talent. So um, as you think about building your pipeline at all levels, Reese certainly at the um, at the high school level, SEO, or inroads at the college level, Twigo at um, the graduate school level, I would advocate to assist you as you think through um, your pipeline efforts. Margaret? Yeah, I, mean, I, I agree with everything everyone said. I think you gotta hire black people, invest with black people, and invest in black neighborhoods. Mic, mic drop. Okay. I love it. Sam, over to you for some questions. Thanks. I think we've answered a lot of the questions that folks have had over the course of this conversation. Um, and I want to thank everyone again. I would like to, you know, there, there are one or two that have really risen to the top in the upvoting that I want to make sure that uh, we answer uh, before we move on to uh, the uh, faculty breakout session. And um, you know, a couple of people have questions about how they can find uh, the Twigo Foundation. Ona, if you don't mind just typing in a URL into uh, into the to the chat feature, that would be fantastic. Um, and maybe uh, Tammy, you could do the same for the Real Estate Executive Council, so folks can find Reese. Um, what one of the questions that comes up, and this comes back to a point that Margaret made right at the beginning uh, about you know, why the built environment is so important, and how you know re as big as real estate is, we still even punch above that weight because we're making decisions about who will have access to good quality housing, who will have access to a grocery store. Who will have access to a park? What will shared and community spaces look like? Um, you know, some of the questions I'm reading, some of the things that people have sent in, um, you know, opportunity zones are not changing the trajectory for us. How do we, in a more thoughtful, comprehensive way, begin to bring um, capital to bear in, in neighborhoods that uh, uh, have been underserved? Well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, when I um, did a, my stint at the Empowerment Zone, one of the things that was very apparent to me, which translated into the business model that I still execute today, was that um, much of how 
a neighborhood exists is dictated by the real estate. And you really cannot change the trajectory of a neighborhood unless you control the real estate or can influence it. Um, and so the ownership of said real estate did not live in the neighborhoods in which we were trying to effectuate change. Um, and as I had conversations after conversations with owners to say, listen, um, the, and this was specific to Upper Manhattan and Harlem, but the Harlem that you understood at the time that you bought your asset, which might have been 30 or 40 years ago, or maybe second or third generational, it is not the same uh, Harlem. And so I am asking you to invest in your asset to improve it, to bring it to a standard which is livable. And I will help you do that. I will give you almost free capital to do so. And the answer was always no, because the calculus was, um, I'm going to put as little money as I can into this asset, I'm gonna extract as much out. Um, and that was the business model. Uh, I said, when I left the empowerment zone, this is an opportunity because we can acquire these assets at below replacement costs, or said another way, below what it costs us to build it, invest capital, bring it to a standard in which I would be happy to live in it, and therefore raise the entire community by taking this eyesore and this negative and making it a positive. And so understanding that took a couple of things. Number one, I lived in a neighborhood, and number two, I was black. And the people who were living in these assets were black and the people who were in the neighborhood were black. So I didn't view them as just a paycheck. I viewed them as um, individuals, as, as clients, as tenants, as part of my history, because at one point in my history, I grew up in the same similar, in a similar situa situation of Tammy, which was seven or eight people in a two bedroom apartment. So I understood that. Um, and so we improved the assets that we bought which therefore improved the neighborhoods and protected the people who were there before. And anyone else yeah, want to jump in? Go yeah, ahead, Tammy. I was going to say, you know, and, and there are studies on this too. If given the opportunity, um, African Americans and other minorities will invest with each other, will hire each other, and there is a multiplier effect that is super important that you know will create jobs in our community. We're not afraid to go into our communities. Just like Jim, I've invested, you know, in areas of New York City. I've invested in other African American communities, and those transactions, to Margaret's point, they've made me a ton of money. They're they're just killing it because there are opportunities that sometimes you can see. You know, to One's point about being innovative, you can see where um, there there is. You want to go where other people aren't going, right? And so if you find the right qualified African-American, for me, I'm more of an LP, so I'll, I'll find a GP that is, you know, going to understand the neighborhood and help me see the similarities. There's a lot of similarities between, you know, um, neighborhoods, particularly African-American neighborhoods, where we know what these neighborhoods need to thrive. And so when you're able to create that, it really creates thousands of jobs. And and that sort of is is, is the ecosystem that needs to occur. And so you know, it's about capital access. I mean, a lot of what we've talked about today is the disparities, you know, they, they have um, a commonality, which is economic. And so, you know, to change neighborhoods, Sam, I believe that you have to get capital in the hands of, of you know, African-American qualified real estate folks. We are out here. We are, you know, they're, they're it's, it's, if you want to have um, help in identifying, you know, some of those, um, those folks, you know, real estate executive council can help. I'm sure Margaret can help. I mean, there's, and so I do think that there's, there's, this is the time, and maybe we can close on this, where we need to um, make sure that we're partnering. It's about partnership because we cannot do this alone. And we're going to have to cross pollinate with Shaq and with Goldman and, you know, with, with Twigo and all these organizations in this ecosystem to me to affect change.